In preparing for this talk, what really caught my attention was the session's tagline, and I quote, the global food security challenge is straightforward. By 2050, the world must feed 2 billion more people. What I thought was ironic is that it, this took me back to 1798 when Thomas Malthus, the British cleric and economist, predicted that population growth was going to outstrip agricultural production. And eventually, nations were going to fall into what they call the Malthusian trap of war, poverty, and depopulation. And it's ironic that we're standing here in 2021 at the start of what the UN Food Systems Summit is calling the Decade of Action. And we're faced with a similar challenge as Malthus, but with this added caveat or pressure of climate change, right? And so for me, the challenge then really is how do we build food systems that are resilient and sustainable in order to feed the 2 billion more people by 2050? Now, this is a tall ask, but how do you eat an elephant? Well, we do it one bite at a time. And where do we start? But for me, I think we start at the farm, right? We start with the soil. I think that's important. What are some of the trends and solutions we identified in the African Agriculture Status Report 2021? And this is an agro report, but me as Renapi, I serve as the technical co-director on this report. Well, there are many key messages that are coming out of this report because we took a system-wide approach. Here we were addressing the question of how to build resilient and sustainable African food systems over the next decade, right? So we looked at the entire system. But if I had to focus in on one key message, again, for me, it starts on the farm, right? At the primary agricultural level. So in this report, what we did is we noted that as a region, Sub-Saharan Africa has registered the most rapid rate of agricultural production growth since 2000 of any region in the world, right? Our output expanded by 4.3% per year in real terms. The world average over that same period was 2.7% per year. So in the report, we note that this is a win for the continent. But here's the flip side to that coin. 75% of agricultural production growth in the region that reflects rapid expansion in cropped area, only 25% from yield growth. So taking us back to the theme of the session, sustainable food security. In this next decade, as a continent, if we're going to achieve sustainable food security, we're going to need to transition from resource-dependent to productivity-led agricultural growth. In short, we need to increase farm productivity on existing land. The status quo is both uh, not sustainable, both environmentally and socially. So going forward, how do we navigate this transition from resource dependent to productivity led growth? What's going to be our pathways? Well, will we as a continent follow agroecology principles or do we lean into modern green revolution technologies? Well, in the ASSR 21 report, we conclude that for Africa, it's not an either or approach. In fact, this is a false dilemma. As a continent, we can do it both ways, right? So improved seed varieties generated by modern technologies are absolutely essential for sustainable food systems in Africa. So is increased use of inorganic fertilizer. But equally important is increased usage of organic inputs, composts, manures, cover crops, as well as integrated soil fertility management practices. For a continent, for us to achieve the balance between these two approaches, we're going to absolutely require developing locally adaptive technologies and innovations that are going to be context-specific, climate-smart, and can facilitate the adoption of sustainable improved practices. So to truly then to make this a local endeavor is going to require that our national governments increase the public spending on agricultural research development and extension services. Now, I know that this is not a new message, and it's one that I've just recently been talking quite a bit about um, lately, but it's a message that bears repeating, this message of invest, public investments in r d e right? Because let's go back to Malthus, right? and his dire prediction of population growth outstripping food production. 
What Malthus didn't account for was the Industrial Revolution and its associated technologies, right? So will this fourth Industrial Revolution with its e-commerce and blockchain technologies embed resilience and sustainability in Africa's food systems in the coming decades? The only way we're going to know is if we invest in Africa's capacity to develop innovative solutions in response to tipping points in the ever-changing landscape of the continent. I think what is very, very important is that governments all over the world and uh, UN uh, people that sit throughout all of those uh, international institutions, that they need to realize it is not land that produces food, it's expertise. And uh, if we do not build that expertise over time, if we do not protect uh, that expertise, if we do not advance the interest of uh, that expertise, then it means your company is going to run into serious, serious trouble. You cannot just take somebody from the street and say, right, tomorrow you start farming. Or you cannot just give a person a piece of land and then expect that person to start farming. Farming nowadays is highly technologically advanced, scientific based, uh, because of the many, many challenges that farmers face. And yes, farmers are almost like heart surgeons. Not, not everyone, a lot of people can become doctors, not everyone an heart surgeon. And I think uh, that's the kind of thinking that we need to promote throughout the world and uh, throughout all of those institutions that are uh, um, party to, to agriculture. Uh, the next big issue that is going to confront agriculture is biosecurity. We see now this pandemic had a major impact on, on humans, the way we live and the way we interact. But we've seen more and more uh, biosecurity issues within the agriculture sector as well. Major outbreaks of food and mouth in South Africa, Rift Valley fever, avian flu all over the world. And it brings an entire uh, commodity sector to a standstill. And I think that we need to prioritize. And it goes with what I've said uh, right at the start. It's expertise that produce food. And if your farmers uh, are experts, uh, and I'm not saying they should be scientists in terms of all of these biosecurity issues, but if they understand it, if they know exactly what to do, if there's an outbreak of a certain disease on their farms, then uh, you, at the end of the day, protect uh, a, a specific sector, to protect the industry at large. Uh, because if that expertise lacks, what happens? The farmer doesn't know. There was an outbreak of food and mouth disease. You find a situation where that disease now spreads to other areas, and whoops, there you sit with a massive dilemma. Then the uh, third issue is, and I think this is where governments play a massive role, infrastructure. Uh, you've seen all over Africa, you've got the best uh, land available. I always say you can plant the top of it. It will start uh, producing pears the next day or apples. But um, it's no use. You've got all that fertile land and you cannot transport your goose from one point uh, to the other point. Or you cannot export it to the rest of the world. So infrastructure is of critical import, uh, importance. In South Africa, we are now busy with an infrastructure bill. Uh, yesterday, we've had quite an uh, extensive meeting on what should be done in terms of road infrastructure, harbor infrastructure, water-related infrastructure, such as dams, canals, pipelines, and stuff like that. I always say, uh, water is not the problem. It's water management that is the problem, especially in, in the South African context. Uh, then logistics. We've seen uh, the nightmare this pandemic has caused with logistics. All over the world, suddenly, there was a shortage of reefer containers, a shortage of boats. Uh, there was uh, some uh, guys that uh, turned their uh, boat sideways in the Swiss Canal, and that impacted on the rest of the world. So how do we make sure that we've got an up and running logistics system? And we need to be very careful not to monopolize logistics systems. Uh, and why I'm saying that is that if there's a crisis in a harbor in Singapore or somewhere in China, uh, that means that you cannot move your reefer containers to other parts of the world. So, uh, and I think we have to rethink in terms of how do we ensure that our logistics system at the end of the day is not, uh, and I put this in brackets, not held hostage by monopolized uh, areas where things are uh, uh, heaped up and then you cannot move.
Another thing is wastage. Wastage is a massive problem all over the world. And it's due to a cold chain system that is not optimized, not working properly. How do we then uh, uh, bring that into play as well? And we need to have a policy environment that or a policy in terms of dealing with wastage. And then we need to come down on uh, people that deliberately leave food to rot uh, and, and so forth. The other issue is fair trade. And we've seen in South Africa how our own industry has suffered as a result of dumping. Uh, and, and, and we need to address that because uh, you can't have a situation where your bigger, uh, more commercialized uh, countries at the end, they just take it for granted that they can bring in stuff and destroy your entire industry as such. Issue of financing. Financing is becoming scarier. Uh, scarcely, it becomes uh, more expensive. How do we ensure that uh, we make funding available to agricultural uh, practices and uh, farmers and entities, but also uh, to other support instruments, for example, uh, to advance certain technologies, uh, or to build certain technologies, to uh, get more uh, scientific research going within the agriculture sector. Uh, and then you cannot divorce agriculture from rural development. Uh, it is no use. And that's the dilemma that we have in South Africa. In fact, I've just spoken to a whole group of farmers earlier today that you cannot have islands of wealth in a sea of poverty. Um, and how do we, and then as a farming sector, contribute towards a rural development, uh, creating better quality jobs? And I, yes, uh, uh, you cannot expect farmers to pay farm workers uh, massive salaries, that will never happen. But it's about human dignity. Uh, and if we don't deal with the issue of human dignity, if we don't deal with the socio-economic environment in which workers find themselves and the lack of opportunities they are in, then your farmer, who uh, they perceive as wealthy, then becomes a target. And then last but not least, we need to focus on growing ownership. Countries that... Uh, uh, focus on transferring ownership of land to uh, people are much more wealthier than that, those that uh, lacks uh, or that's not committed to uh, advanced ownership of land. And we've seen in mass, uh, many countries, the issue of collateral is closely linked to ownership. And if you don't deal with it, et cetera. Then farmer support, technical, extension services, and so forth. And then something that I want to end on. We do not have a balance between the environment, the natural environment, and farming. Then we're going to leave a legacy behind that our children will blame us forever. And we've seen in uh, the Amazon uh, areas, we've seen in parts of Africa, how the natural environment is completely destroyed, and we don't put an alternative in place. If Africa loses its natural fauna and flora, uh, you can just imagine that massive impact it will have on other industries, such as tourism, et cetera, et cetera, mm. and ultimately on climate change.